Everybody sing in this sweet refrain. Let us unite, let us unite. Sing this melody till it gets in your brain. Well, I'm talking to you, Muslim, Christian, and the Hebrew. Anything to do, we got to unite, or else we are through. Let us unite, let us unite. Everybody sing in this sweet refrain. Let us unite, let us unite. Sing this melody till it gets in your brain. Greetings. My name is James Betts. I'm a preacher of freedom, justice, and equality for black people in America and the totality of the planet Earth. I'm a student of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's teachings as presented by himself as well as a student under the tutelage and guidance of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, as he presents, as he is the exponent, number one exponent, of the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in a more evolved way than the Honorable Elijah Muhammad himself presented them uh, prior to 1977. Today we want to explore various questions that uh, Sister Chanel have formulated that deals with myself, Dr. Collett, my plans for the future. How much of that we'll be able to cover, I don't know. But we want to do as good a job as possible in treating each one of the questions that she raised. When did you first meet Brother Khaled, and what was your impression of him? Uh, since I first met uh, Dr. Khaled in, I think it was 1978, 1978. And my, my impression of him was that he was a serious organizer and serious uh, student and helper to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan which I was, I was constantly looking for people that were willing to help Minister Farrakhan. And I saw him as such. You were both ministers under Minister Farrakhan on the West Coast. Yes. Did the two of you work closely together at any time? Well, we, I was assigned uh, to uh, work with Dr. Collett, and he was assigned to work with me in helping with a radio broadcast. Uh, that work never really materialized. Uh, Minister Farrakhan had assigned Brother Abraham or Ibrahim in, in Chicago to send me tapes of his of a recent nature so that I could play them on the radio on the radio broadcast because I had money uh, to pay for the radio, a 30-minute uh, slot on, on the radio in Fresno, California. And so he had a sign, Brother Abraham in Chicago and his son Joshua and Dr. Collett in Los Angeles to supply me with tapes. Uh, all three of them had problems getting 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 tapes to me. So I had to discontinue the radio broadcast because Minister Farrakhan had initially sent uh, some recent tapes where he had where he had spoken in, in various venues throughout the country. But we played all of those and we were never able to get constant refreshment of new tapes. So that that never really materialized the assignment to work together. Mm. <clears throat> Could you share with us the first time you conceived of murdering Dr. Collett and what triggered that thought? Uh, well, what triggered it? What triggered the, the thought? was 
the constant interference of, uh, and co co cooperation between my former wife and Dr. Collett in creating problems for my children. But the, the culmination of it came when my second oldest daughter, Maisa, decided that she wanted to marry uh, a young white man, which, as far as I was concerned, it was, it was of no concern. It should have been of no concern to uh, Sister Laverne, and it certainly should have been of no concern to uh, Dr. Collett. He had a relationship with my former wife, not with my children. So, and I told her that if she wanted to submit her life and let him regulate it, that was okay with me. I have no problem with that. And I even told him that I, I don't make my, cho my, make my choices my children's choice. In other words, I don't choose who they can marry and who they cannot marry. I don't make such choices. I don't impose uh, the color of the, the the color of the skin of the person that they're going to be with, the color of the eyes of the person that they're going to be with. I don't make those choices and impose them on them. And I was averse to hearing any kind of stuff like that coming out of either one of their mouths, Sister Laverne or him. So after, after uh, several sessions, and I, I, we, we, it was obvious that they had a different worldview than I did, and uh, they saw the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's teachings different than I do. And so, but it was not, as far as I was concerned, about how we saw the teachings. It was about a child, but an adult, making a decision for her life and how she would live her life. Now, certainly, Laverne had an, an inordinate amount of influence in the life of the child because Maisa's mother died having her. So Laverne was uh, a big person in her mind because she was uh, the uh, second mother that she knew. I'm, I married, I married, um, I married a, Laverne was the third woman, third woman that I married. So. Maisa's mother died, which was my first wife. Then I married a second time, and the third time was Laverne. So that's a large person in her mind. But I had a problem with both Laverne and Dr. Collett over that. And that was when I decided that I'll eliminate him out of this child's life. And People can say, and people will look at that and say, well, oh, that wasn't, that wasn't, uh, that's certainly not serious enough to kill somebody. Mm. And it may not be for somebody else, but it was for me. It was for me. My child had gone through lots of adults abuse and misuse and I wasn't about to sit idly by and watch more so I was willing to stop it <laughs> that was about a year before I actually uh, carried it out the attempt to kill it I mean, between the time I made the decision and the time that I acted on it. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean. There are rumors that you worked with the Jews to murder Dr. Pollard. 
Is this true? No, it's not true. I've never, I've never worked for hire with anyone to harm or to kill anyone. The people that make such a charge, they should be required by the public to come up with evidence to support or to validate their statement. Or otherwise, they should be required to shut their mouth on that issue. But in today's society, people go on the internet and they slander and libel each other. Um, some lawyers even do it. I'm surprised, um, especially with, you know, lawyer, all, all lawyers are officers of the court. But even they get on there and make libelous statements, and they should know better. But there's no evidence. None exists because it never happened that I worked for the Jews or with the Jews to harm Dr. Collins. That's not true. It has nothing to do with the Jews. But it helps to put a, a cloud over my head among people in the black community. And perhaps it may induce some young uh, black person to harm me because they would feel that they're getting rid of uh, an agent of the Jews. Mm. That's how I see that. What will put this lie to rest? Well, I think that if those those that um, that have gone public and said this over the last twenty three years during my term of of, be, of it being incarcerated, if they were if they were set on a platform before me um, and would be required to bring forth their evidence, which they can't bring forth because there isn't any, I think that would put it to rest. Mm -hmm. But I suspect that most of them would not be willing to sit before me and make such a charge. It's easier to make the charge from behind the door. Hmm. Yeah. But the public should require that those that come before them and say things and make charges against others, the, ch the public should require that evidence be presented. Give me some hard copy. Uh, if you have, if you have uh, a canceled check, where some say that I received twenty five thousand dollars from Jews, if they have a canceled check, where I got twenty five thousand dollars from Herb Rubin or any other Jew, I mean, if, if that's if that's legitimate evidence, people can examine it and determine whether it is legitimate or not. That would be some hard copy, some hard evidence. In the absence of that, you, we're just dealing with charges. Mm -hmm. Talk. Loose talk. Um, what brought you and Brother Collett to breaking point as friends? My, ch my children, my children, that, that's it and that's all. Um, nothing else. I mean, um, as far as I'm concerned, I'm the father of my children. 
I'm the one that have the responsibility to give them guidance and direction. And I don't see that uh, responsibility to anyone. I really don't. Um, in a previous tape, yes, you talked about um, Khaled showing your children how to play with guns. Yes. What did you mean when you said he wanted to teach your children how to play with guns? Well, uh, what I meant by that was uh, he had a he had a posture. He had a posture of uh, taking pictures with a. Uh, young children and arm and arming them teaching them how to how to uh, how to uh, handle guns I train my own children how to handle bow and arrows and various other weapons but under my supervision I don't permit anybody else to do that anybody else you know I talked to him and uh, the children's mother about about this and told them straight up you know don't even get into that area you know he had a relationship with her not with my children so that's what I mean Who, who introduced your children to Brother Collins? Uh, their mother. Do you know who introduced uh, Brother Collins to Sister Laverne? Uh, himself. Uh, he came to my home when I wasn't there. And at the time, he met her and my children. Did you harbor any ill feelings as a result of this introduction? Uh, not really. Not really. Not really. Mm -hmm. I think that um, uh, the relationship between myself and Sister Laverne at the time, had it had deteriorated so much so that I had grown I had grown beyond the relationship. Uh, I did not want to be with her. And, you know, we had discussed that. Did they develop a friendship? Well, um, I wouldn't call it a friendship, but I guess, I, I guess other, others may would re refer to it as a friendship. Um, I think since her position was that uh, she was going to bring me down, uh, she saw herself as a conduit for him into my world. Hmm. And a way that she could, he, he could monitor me through her. what I was doing in the Northwest, what I was doing in Canada, so forth and so on. Did you ever share your vision of building a church with Dr. Collins? I never shared it, I never shared it with him, but some of his closer associates uh, knew about that vision. But not, I never shared it with him directly, no. Do you know what his response was? Do you know what his, how he <laughs> well, saw you? Well, I think the, um, yes, I knew, I knew. Um, many, and, and I would even go so far as to say most, most of the, most of the ministers within the Nation of Islam from from my point of view, right now, don't have 
the healthiest, the healthiest view and vision of, of the church. So, many of the uh, ministers, I, I'll, use, I'll use two as typical examples. Brother B.R., who was, who was an old, old line uh, helper of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and Brother Ra, another one. They have never thought of the idea of a church being used to teach the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's teachings uh, as, as a way of using a clean glass to put it beside a dirty glass. See, if you condemn, if you condemn the Christianity that's taught in the church, and you don't condemn Jesus and his teachings, and you you see value in Jesus' teachings, then you can teach those teachings in a church. And you can teach the, the, the very way that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught, Master Farad Muhammad, and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, you can teach that under a church structure. And that is a way of putting a clean glass of water for the people to come and get a drink from that compares to a dirty glass. White supremacy is taught under Christianity. Black inferiority is taught under Christianity. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad don't teach black inferiority. So we teach the evolvement or development of black people, the discovery of black gifts, black talents, and the development of black gifts and black talents. We can teach that in a church setting. You don't have to have a mosque, a masjid to teach that. For instance, we have the, the we have the tongue twister uh, 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 ma mosque in Chicago, Mosque Marion. Uh, that name, Mosque Marion, and not to pick on the name. I think it's I think it's valuable that the that the minister named it after a woman. And I understand that Jesus and his mother were a sign of two men and a people. We the people. Okay. However, if we had a name on that mosque that, that would be changed into a church, and the name was Rosa Parks, that name, Rosa Parks, would resonate more with our people than Mary Ann, as far as I'm concerned. Mary Ann is a sign of our women. Okay? A sign. The Honorable Louis Farrakhan said, if you focus on the sign, you follow the sign, you become a sign. Okay? If we take that which the sign points to, exalt it and elevate it, I think we get more, we get more energy, we create more movement. So if if it was named the Mother Church of Mother Rosa Parks, I think I think it would resonate with our people more so. That's how I think. Now, see. I don't think most of the Muslim ministers would, would readily agree with that. I think they would consider me putting the minister down for having named the mosque Mariana. I'm not putting him down. I'm, I believe in the exaltation of women. I just believe that Mary Ann is a sign of our women. Certainly she's also 
a sign of the, the uh, nurturing quality of Almighty God and his Christ. Master Farad Muhammad, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and we as a people. But short, shorthand, shorthand, Maryam is a sign of our women. Instead of raising the sign up that represent our women, let's, let's raise our women up. Let's, let's say Mother Church, Rosa Parks, name another one after Ida B. Wales, and so forth and so on, all over the country. Matter of fact, all of the houses of worship, name them after our women and put them in charge of it. Let all the resident ministers be women. That's what I think. And that's, that's an idea that most of the ministers, I don't think, agree. They did not agree with it, and they, I don't think they still agree with it. But uh, that's immaterial to me. I don't care whether they agree or not. That's my idea, and that's my vision for the future. That's my vision for getting our people. Yes, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, through the minister, he'll get all of his people. Uh, the minister is the one who inspired me to see it this way, based on how he teaches and how he moves. Now, he didn't sit down and tell me, uh, uh, Brother James, do this, do that, do that. But the inspiration, the inspiration comes from him. He's, he's my inspiration. Real talk. And plus, I want to see, I want to see the time period shorten. I believe it would take more than 450 years for there to be equality based on uh, how the Orthodox Muslims teach Islam and practice it. So I don't want to use them as a model. But you didn't ask all that. <laughs> Some or many will ask, didn't you think about the impact of your choice to murder Brother Collins? Of course I thought about it. Of course I thought about it. Uh, but my thoughts about it uh, were not enough to uh, prevent me from attempting to carry it out. Yes, I thought about it. I thought about it a thousand times. I um, labored with the idea. Uh, I, like all of us, had and have uh, impediments character traits that in many respects are not conducive to the healthiest choice making. Uh, many of my many of my decision making skills uh, were piss poor at best. And so as I look back Hindsight is an improvement over previous insight. But yes, I thought about the uh, implications of it, but it was not enough to prevent me from doing it. Uh, there will be, I honestly believe that this is a, 
subject that I will have to deal with and probably will be dealing with for the rest of my life. And I'm hoping that it will help others to deal with uh, character development among leadership, uh, hypocrisy among leadership, because that's what the whole issue speaks to, as I see it. As I see it. Thank you.